Welcome to the Education in Isolation podcast with me, Angela Connell, where we will explore the challenges of businesses moving from a face-to-face training mode to an online training environment. Many businesses have been caught off guard by the COVID-19 pandemic, but the situation is proving to be a catalyst for new possibilities and opportunities for the training industry. Let me and my guests help you make the most of these opportunities and to navigate the transition so that you and your organisation come out stronger and more resilient than when you went in. Education is the answer and you are the leader. Hi Trevor and welcome to Education in Isolation. So let's jump into it. Who are you and what do you do? Well, first up, um, I'm Trevor Connell, and you may gather from that name, I'm actually Angela's father. Um, I'm, uh, I own a, an event photography business, and I also publish the specialevents.com.au website, which is a news and information service for the event industry. Awesome. So you've, You've been affected in your business, but the industry as well has been affected massively uh, through uh, COVID nineteen and the social distancing requirements. So we're gonna we're gonna have a look at this at a, as a twofold uh, process. So what do you think has been the biggest challenge to the event industry since COVID nineteen? Well, first up in the event industry, we talk about Black Friday, Friday the thirteenth of March, when Uh, the Prime Minister made the announcement that our industry was going to be shut down for six months. Mm -hmm. Essentially, um, myself and pretty much everyone else in the business, by the following Monday, after that weekend, all of our business for the next six months had gone. And so everyone in the industry had to very quickly turn around and come up with a strategy to get through the next six months. The first things we saw were events going online. Uh, For example, there was a expo that was lined up in Brisbane that was due to happen on the 24th and 25th of March. So there they were two weeks out and they had to shut that expo down. They turned to YouTube, who was actually one of their partners in the uh, expo, and created an online expo in two weeks, which was just extraordinary. There were also seminars that went online, um, awards. So one of the industry associations for the uh, events industry is Meetings Events Australia, Their conference and awards were due uh, a week ago, actually, two weeks weeks ago now. They're also a client of ours. Yes, (laughs) yes. Um, And so the conference had to be cancelled. That was number one. But the awards needed to go ahead. So within the uh, couple of, well, couple of months, actually, between when the that conference was due to happen and when and since Black Friday, the Sydney International Convention Centre had set up in-house a studio, um, essentially a full broadcast studio. And so the awards were staged in that studio and broadcast to the... Um, Uh, to the industry participants. Interestingly enough, the awards generally have around about three, maybe 400 people attend the awards. There are actually 500 people signed in online for those awards. Mm. And with each of them, there could have been two or three people who were actually actually watching. Mm. So in the end, the awards captured a greater audience than what it would have if it was just done 
in the flesh. Mm. So they were able to expand into a, a broader market and people who'd normally not be able to get along or they may have even had more people from the same organisation. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, what they did with that was they also brought people in on Zoom um, from various locations around Australia or from their own homes and had them on standby as the um, as finalists uh, ready for uh, the announcement to be made so that they could actually make an, a, an acceptance speech. Mm. Yeah, it's very different. I know since uh, since going into isolation, we've had a lot of events that we've attended that are now were supposed to be live events uh, face-to-face and we uh, ended up going online. So there has been a massive difference to how we're attending events. And what I found personally is that we can actually have more of our team members attend, attend these events now because they're online. So that's been a massive impact to the event industry. I know MEA... Uh, being one of our clients, they were affected straight away. Um, personally, with your business, what happened? Okay, so with um, event picks, I essentially six months' work uh, just disappeared overnight. Um, and that, okay, it was okay for me. I was able to get JobKeeper. Um, my assistant who works with me was able to get JobKeeper. But I've got about 50 photographers around Australia who get regular work from me. As a contractor. As subcontractors, exactly. Mm. And um, now most of those are sole traders. And so I actually advised them immediately, to before JobKeeper was announced, in fact, to go and get registered with, um, uh, with Centrelink. Some of them were like a bit reluctant, but I said, no, look, just go and get registered because whatever happens, you need to be in a situation where you can move quickly to be able to recover some income. So what what gave you the insight to get them to go? Like some people just thought this was just going to blow over. What made you think now you have to go and do this right now? Okay, so going back to before Friday the 13th, we were in a situation for about a month, so from mid-February to mid-March, we were in this situation where we had no clue as to what was going to happen. And the industry was being shut, like you know, there was the initial thing of the very large events being shut down, um, and you could see this progressing, the shutdown. And so within the industry, it was incredibly frustrating because we had no idea how long this was going to last. Mm. So although Black Friday was the, the big shutdown announcement, at least that gave us a time frame. Yeah. The Prime Minister came out and said, okay, essentially the industry, our industry, tourism industry, um, restaurants, all of that sort of thing, we're all going to be shut down for six months. So then we could plan. Mm. Then we could actually plan and go, okay, so we know we're going to be shut down for six months. What All these events that we've got planned in that time, what's going to happen with them? Um, and so if you were running a wedding venue, for example, then you would go, okay, we're going to have no weddings for six months. What are we going to do in that time? If you were running... Um, uh, a music festival, then you would go, okay, music festivals just have to be cancelled for the rest of this year. If you were running a uh, mm. conference, mm. Uh, then you go, okay, are we going to try and postpone the conference? Are we going to take it online? Or are we just going to cancel the conference? Just going back to um, uh, MEA, Meetings Events Australia, for example, their conference was actually due to happen uh, two weeks ago, along with when the awards were on. They, uh, following the awards, they made the announcement that the conference would happen in, I think it's about six weeks' time, and it will be a one-day online-only um, delivery. So once, once there was some sort of structure then at least 
uh, business could and plan you could do ahead. some planning around it. Yeah, we did the same thing with the training industry, and I just forecasted straight away that it was going to be at least six months. And we had a lot of naysayers who were saying, "No, no, 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 we'll just." shut down the RTOs for a couple of weeks and then all be back again. But I knew this was going to be a long-term um, change that was going to affect the industry. So with your industry, what were the hurdles? So you've already gone through some of them, but what were the hurdles that what they faced? And, and, and what have you seen that has been innovative in changes that they've done to change the industry? Okay, so within the industry, the ones that turned around quickest were, in fact, the AV companies. Mm. Um, now, the AV companies have cameras, video screens, um, uh, all audio equipment, etc. They've got all of that. They quickly set up studios. So, for example, there's the Masonic Centre in the centre of um, Sydney. The AV supplier that is in-house in that venue took one of the um, convention spaces, conference rooms, and turned that into a studio. So that meant that anyone who have their office in the CBD could easily just walk to that venue and they could do a presentation to their staff, to their board, um, they could do virtual board meetings from there and so forth. So all of that was within that venue. Yeah. Um, there's another company that um, did a similar thing up in Brisbane um, in at the Howard Smith Wharves. Um, Scene Change are uh, the in-house AV company there. They did the same thing. Set up, basically they set up this huge um, um, data screen uh, uh, LED screen, and um, and they might as well have it set up there than sitting in the warehouse. Yeah. And so they were then able to offer that service there. And then there's others that have done the same thing in um, that I'm aware of in Melbourne and Adelaide, and I'm sure it's happened elsewhere as well. I already mentioned ICC Sydney. They did that broadcast studio there. And that broadcast studio there, they're actually doing quite a bit because ICC Sydney is government owned. It's owned, actually owned by the New South Wales government. So they're now delivering programs for the New South Wales government to um, schools and, um, uh, and other, other sort of aspects of, um, of government. Um, so they were the ones that, that um, turned around. They're also the ones with the biggest investment, of course, because they've got massive investment in equipment and storage and trucks and whatever. Um, speaking of trucks, there are other companies, for example, um, that own a fleet of trucks to move their equipment around. One of them is a fireworks company. Suddenly, there's no fireworks shows on, but they've got all these trucks. So they went into the trucking business <laughs> and they were just putting it out. We've got trucks and drivers. Um, so, uh, and there's, there's various other stories like that. Mm. The hardest hit are, in fact, the venues mm. um, because they just got no can't people operate. there anymore. <laughs> they, they just can't operate. Yeah. The, in terms of comeback, and I know that's probably going to be your next question, um, in terms of comeback, the biggest challenge for the industry now is the four square metre rule. Mm -hmm. And the way that's affecting the industry is that if you take a theatre, for example, a theatre with um, whether it's opera, ballet, uh, plays, whatever, the four square metre rule means that they can only have 20 to 25% capacity in that venue. Mm. Forget about all the other stuff they've got to do with um, hand sanitizers and etc. 20% capacity is not viable for those venues to open. Because you were saying that they need to run at 80%. 80%. Yeah. They need 80% to cover costs. Yeah. Then, you know, the other 20% is where they can make their profit. Um, so that has affected them. Then you go to the next. So if you think of a venue then that's going to have an awards dinner, um, okay, so because you've got tables, you've got less people than if you do theatre style, but they're still going to be reduced to around 50% capacity. And I know that there are now people who do awards programs are going, well, okay, 
what can we do in a venue where we've only got 50% capacity? Mm. Um, uh, we can't go to a bigger venue for the awards, um, but we can at least get uh, 50% in and do that. Yeah. Because the training industry has had the same effect um, on them. Like a lot of them did move to online, but now they're coming back to face to face, and they're going to have the same uh, social distancing rules within their their rooms as well. So I can see this Im- impacting on them as well. What do you think will be the solution to this? Okay, so what we had to do as a business, as a photography business, was to go. All right. Um, our core business is um, graduations, awards, uh, conferences, expos, um, stuff like that. That's stuff, nothing for six months. So we had to come up with something else. And um, what actually brought me to what I'm going to come to was two funerals. Um, the first up was my mother's funeral, Angela's grandmother. Um, and that was in South Australia. We uh, border lockdowns. <laughs> uh, basically, I had to get over there and get out again because the uh, South Australian border was locking down. Mm. We could only have um, ten people at the funeral, so I quickly, at the last minute, just set up my phone to do a Facebook live um, transmission. I think that the... was at my request as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I quickly realised the limitation mm. of doing something like that on a phone. A month later, I was at another funeral, um, my partner's this time, and so uh, we're mother, still... Mother, partner's mother. Uh, my, yes, sorry, not my partner, my partner's mother. Um, uh, so for her funeral, we're still in the same situation where we can only do 10 people. So this time, I've done some research by this time, and uh, so I set up a um, D- DSLR, a, you know, a, one of my um, professional cameras, and connected that to a laptop. There was some certain software, and I was able to do that to YouTube Live. So following that, I went, okay, there's a need for this because even when we come out of the lockdown here, the lockdown for interstate and certainly international travel is going to be uh, continuing. So I very quickly just went in and um, looked at what's involved in doing um, live streaming. Mm. And so I've got a network of photographers. They've all got cameras that can be used as video cameras. And so with the addition of some hardware and some software and some technical know-how and calling in um, a friend of mine who uh, used to be a uh, panel operator at the ABC, at ABC Television, who actually knows all this stuff. So we're now putting the gear together and we've launched a new business doing live casting for um, weddings, funerals, but... Then extending that, so that's on the um, on the social side, as I as I call it. But then you go to business, business. events, and with business events, then um, I already have a client who we do photography for, who had asked me about delivering their training that they do. Mm. So this client um, does a whole series of uh, seminars, interactive seminars. And they need to now continue delivering that. So what we've come up with is that we can use this same live casting process to go into a seminar studio. We can do two or three cameras. We can take another input from um, whatever you're using for slideshows for uh, speaker support. We can mix all that live. So um, essentially, our client will do their presentation live we will mix that live and record it. And they're in like a studio set up? Well, no, they'll be in there wherever they Office, are. Yeah. They'll be in wh- yeah. wherever their training seminar is. Yeah. We will just bring in the cameras, the lighting and the associated equipment and do it there live. So they're not out of their comfort zone. Mm. They can um, they can just present. And what I suggest to them is, look, get some of your staff if you've got nobody else and sit them there um, as if you've got 
a, audience. Um, um, a, a not an audience. You've got a a, a a group of people that you're doing your presentation yeah. to, yeah. so that you're not doing it to a blank wall. Yeah. Essentially, we, yeah, we've had that issue with some of our clients. They find it difficult talking to a camera because they, it's not an audience. So. And so, what we talk, talk to them about is don't talk to the camera. Mm. Talk to this person, even when, even when. Uh, uh, sorry, the, so just going back a step, the reason we were able to step into this very quickly is that part of the uh, Event Picks business model is that we do um, vox pox and social media clips at conferences and expos. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means is that we use our DSLRs, our normally still cameras. We record short video clips. They might be 30 seconds to 90 seconds. We download them and I have an assistant on site who edits them immediately and they go out on social media straight away, captioned, titled and bang. So we have that technology that we're already working with so to take that to that next step uh to do it as a live cast um was quite straightforward but in that sense we're working with people who are not used to talking to camera and so we get some a room full of people normally well or they're at an expo <laughs> yeah and they're at an expo and there's just people around mm -hmm. and so what we do is we put the interviewer right next to the camera and we get the subject to talk to the person, not the camera. Mm. So they're looking slightly off camera, but that's fine. Mm. That's absolutely fine. So in terms of putting it together for um, a seminar or a training session, then essentially we do it live, capture it as if it's a, um, a regular presentation, and then we can do post-edit on that afterwards. But then I looked into what the delivery platforms are. So we've now got the right delivery platform for that where it can go in. Um, it can be uh, video on demand. Um, it can have a paywall. Um, uh, there's lots of different aspects that can be used there. Um, uh, and what we recommend to our clients is using that in conjunction with a Zoom meeting or something once a week. So, uh, yeah. so essentially uh, what... You've changed the business model now to how you can deliver is you can have the live event, record it, and what I see in the future is you could have people there as well as recording the event and going live. Um, and I actually see this in the future. This is the way we're going to go. Um, with the training industry, I certainly see that we definitely have to have a online model uh, as part of the, our delivery method. How do you see the future, six, six to 12 months in the future, of what the event industry and, on, and delivery of any events Hybrid events are here to stay. Mm. Now, um, I'm going to go for a little history lesson here, and I'm going to go back to 1998, which was the pilot strike. Um, so what happened was that uh, pilots wanted more money or whatever. They went on strike, and essentially that shut down domestic travel, um, domestic air travel in Australia. Um so what happened at that time was that video conferencing got uh, – it was around, but essentially – Not widely used. But it became very, very widely used then. It was damned expensive mm -hmm. because you didn't have NBN or even ADSL, um, I think, at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and so – it was quite expensive. You had to set up a line, um, a, a direct line from Sydney to Melbourne, for example, so that you could do a video conferencing um, set up. And you needed equipment. There was also uh, yeah, yeah, it was very expensive to set up. But once it was set up, it continued. And video conferencing has been a part of the landscape in Australia since then. So well before your Zoom and, um, and all of those sort of platforms, which has now made it a lot more affordable. So now that um, we're in this situation where video conferencing has become a thing, where online delivery of um, events and seminars and so forth is a thing, 
it will continue. Where I'm also seeing that, um, where I think it's going to continue is with conferences. So I think that um, the big thing was um, selling tickets to a conference so that you would go to the conference. That's still going to happen, obviously, and people are going to be keen to get back to the conferences. But I can see a lot more of an online side to those conferences. So it'd be co-delivery. So co-delivery, yeah. exactly, exactly. I'm also I'm also thinking that that's going to happen with um, awards as well. Mm. Um, uh, so uh, just going back to the uh, the Mia Awards, I think that it worked really well the way that they did it, um, and I can see a future where that delivery will continue. Um, they will be webcast or uh, or whatever. It's already been happening with um, both me. These are the awards I'm quite familiar with. Um, the Meetings Industry Awards and the Australian Event Awards have been webcast previously, but the audience has been fairly... Not many. Yeah, yeah, not, not as big. I think that that online audience will now increase for those type of events. I think there's such a big opportunity where we now um, have the opportunity to be able to get access to more people. So in the delivery of training, in events and things like that, I was talking to uh, one, uh, a business coach who was based in, who is based in Brisbane, and uh, he's now got an audience across Australia and, and around the world. So I see there being so many more opportunities where we've got the live event, and of course, people are going to want to go to the live events because they want to do that socialising side. But then there is that whole opportunity of the people who would have missed out in the past, in particular if they were in Western Australia and they're going to miss an event that's on the east coast um or they're overseas uh now we're able to bring those um audiences in and have that opportunity so uh, i'm glad to hear that that would be happening with the event industry and so much so for the training industry a big uh, issue and concern that we've had with the australian training industry is our international students. So at the moment, we can't bring any of the international students into Australia, um, and it looks like it will be for the rest of the year. Um, and it may we don't know when next year we may be able to bring them in, but I see this opportunity uh, with doing these events. Would you see that this be the same within the event industry with internet, where you would have had international conferences, the opportunity to be able to bring that in online? Um, yeah, look, it already happens to a certain extent where uh, you, at conferences they bring in um, guest speakers online. Mm. Uh, that happens. That happens quite a bit, right? The what people haven't really worked out yet, um, although there are methods for it. It's not really working properly yet, and that's monetizing it. Mm. And um, that's the uh, that's really the challenge is how to monetize those sort of um, online events, because particularly with the younger generation, they're used to getting everything online for free. <laughs> they're used to just uh, paying a minimal fee. And getting their music for basically for free, um, and they're not in that. They don't have that mindset of having to pay for something, and there's got to be a shift in that for this to be really successful. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I have no solution for that. No, <laughs> Where we can no, change that, no. and I know that's been across the board with um, a variety of different. Like I, I know. We used to do live workshops and we were doing them in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, uh, Adelaide. And from those live workshops, I would have a variety of current clients and uh, public. So it would be people who have never uh, seen us or worked with us before. And I know I'd convert um, people would come along to those events and workshops and see you know, how well they could work with us and then I'd end up 
uh, getting them on as members. Now we don't have that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. it's trying to do it online. So I think there is a, a big opportunity out there to be able to educate uh, the industry and educate people who are delivering training and who were using that as a method to get new clients. How do we do this online? Hmm. Yeah. So that 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 will be another podcast, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So we've gone through um, the, how it's affected your business, how it's affected the industry as a whole. Um, what do you think has been your biggest achievement through this whole process? What have you learnt? Mm, okay. Um, look, I think that um, the achievement has been to it has been to see an opportunity and to and to leverage it. Um, uh, I guess that's that's what it's been. And what have I learnt? It's like um, don't give up, uh, essentially, because. Um, uh what what we've all been doing in the industry um is essentially going yeah we're going to come out the other side mm. um it might take out. it might take 12 months uh and you know back in march we had no idea how long this was going to take no idea at all we're getting a better picture now but um but uh, but we still we still don't know and I think you know, just learn to accept and um, and go with the flow. Yeah. One of the things that I've really seen is all of the innovation. There's been so many new ideas that have come up, uh, different ways of delivering uh, training, uh, different ways of delivering events, uh, which I think is going to propel uh, us forward with with how we're going to be delivering events in the future. Like I've been talking to our clients for years about getting their training online and they never saw it as a must-do or a must-have, whereas now they were forced to. I think now, though, we've got the technology and the tools to do this. You imagine if this had happened to us 10 years ago. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We wouldn't have coped because <laughs> mm. we wouldn't have been able to get it all online. Mm. Um, okay, so let's go with our last question. What keeps you motivated? I just go for a walk each morning. <laughs> and I just get out and nice crisp air and, um, yeah, basically. Mm. Because I just have a routine of just getting up. Still, I still get up early each morning and just go for a walk mm. rather than just sort of lying around and waiting for it to happen. Yeah, yeah. I think that is a big part is uh, having a routine. Mm. Uh, I know, you know some people put their head in the sand, other people just took action mm. and and trying to identify different ways of doing things. Like, And I know you launched your own podcast as well uh, during this time. Yeah, well, with the special events site, I um, I realised that I couldn't get out to um, actually, well, there were no events to go to, to, to write about or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I just, it's 20 years since I started the special events website and I was going to do a whole retrospective this year. And so what I decided on was to do a podcast whereby I chat to people in the industry and get them to tell me their story, not not what great achievements they've got, what not motivational stuff or anything at all like that. But I actually start off my interview with them by asking them where and when they were born, um, and then where'd they go to school, what what did how did they get started in their industry. The industry. How did they get to where they are now? And there's some fascinating stories there. Absolutely fascinating stories. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, you know, that was a that was a shift to go and do that. Um, learn how to do podcasting. <laughs> um, learn that Zoom is actually useless for <laughs> for recording podcasts, <laughs> and then found a better platform, um, and so on. So, yeah. 
yeah. I think it's just getting out there and trying new things and um, identifying opportunities uh, yep. for the future. Yep. Well, thank you very much, Trevor, for attending our Education in Isolation uh, podcast. It's been interesting insights. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a few people who are going to want to know more about um, how they can record their training and events online as well. I think it's um, a great opportunity for our industry to be able to do live events as well, um, with which will be combined with their face-to-face -face events. So, yeah, thank you very much for attending today. Fantastic. You've been listening to the Education in Isolation podcast with me, Angela Connell. Do you know someone else who could benefit from learning about opportunities and strategies to provide training online? Please take a moment to share this and other episodes via your podcast app, email or social media channels. Each share helps us reach listeners just like you who can benefit from our content. The Education in Isolation podcast is proud to be part of the Experts on Air podcast network.